All right. So thanks to Danny and Chris for talking us through, hopefully convincing everyone why you should care about the curb. Um, I'm going to build off of that and talk about a proposed solution for how we can start to map curb regulations. Um, as important as every other part of the curb is, I'm not going to focus on that at all. All I care about is the street edge of the curb and what you can and cannot do there. Um, so my name is Emily Eros. I am at Shared Streets. And a little bit of background, we are a nonprofit and we build open source tools and digital governance models to help cities move, to help keep cities moving. So technology has changed, mobility has changed, and we wanna make sure that cities have the data and the tools and the information that they need to plan and manage their streets. Um, so I have a slightly different perspective on this because I work closely with various cities that are trying to manage their streets. And we also have relationships with different companies. And outside of OSM, the curb is an incredibly hot topic um, where everybody wants a piece of this. Um, so what we've been doing is creating a data standard for the curb, a way that we can communicate this regardless of base map, regardless of who you are. Um, and so as we've gone about doing that, we've had to think about how can this be compatible with OSM so that there's an open way that anybody can participate? You don't have to be a city or a company. Um, and so we've thought closely about how we could make this data fit. And what we've arrived at is that we don't believe that OSM is an appropriate place to store regulatory data, but we do think that it could hold the building blocks, the physical assets that are on the street, and we could derive from that elsewhere. So I'll talk through a little bit about that process and how we came to that understanding and how this works and how you can participate today. Um, so if you weren't in uh, Chris and Danny's talk, um, just to summarize briefly, um, mobility is changing. Uh, the way that we shop and the way that we move around cities has changed dramatically in the last five, 10 years. And so cities everywhere are trying to cope with that. They're trying to reallocate right of way that used to just be dedicated to parking and not really thought about. Now we're thinking, well, how do we allocate that in a way that reflects demand for it today? Um, and so in order to do that, cities are starting to think about, well, what could this look like? Companies are trying to get a bigger kind of piece of this. Um, other companies are interested in how they can charge for this. But nobody can do any of this unless we have an understanding of how this public right-of-way is allocated today. So where are we starting from? And it turns out that this is actually a really difficult problem. Because when we talk about curb regulations, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship with physical space. So your average street has you know, up to four regulations on each side, each with a start and an ending place. And what we're talking about is mapping a legal regulation. So we're mapping where a temporal restriction or a restriction about who can do what, where, at what time, how does this apply on the edge of the street? Um, so the regulations themselves are complicated enough, but the location is actually the really hard part. So, What's going on in the background is that a ton of cities across the country are struggling with this problem and they're each doing it in their own way. There's been no standard way to collect this data or store it. And so we work with some cities like DC that are using computer visioning. We work with other cities like Eugene, Oregon that have an intern, Kyle, who goes out and walks the streets with a notebook. Um, and it, it gets the job done, but it means that we're all doing it in silos and we're each getting a piece of this that doesn't work for other cities. In the absence of collaboration, a ton of vendors and companies have sprung up, some of which are just doing the surveying, but some have a view towards managing the public right of way. Um, and when you have a private company offering a technical mapping solution that really is a backdoor to managing a city's physical space, that's a dangerous thing. Um, so what we've been working on is an open standard, Curb LR, or Curbler, rhymes with Hamburglar uh, for short, um, that basically just creates a way to say, Here's a common. Here's a way we can solve the technical problem. If we can give cities and companies a way to start to exchange this data, very similar to GTFS for transit, then we're all on an even playing field. Um, vendors can do the surveying. They can give the data to cities in a way they can use. Um, and cities have a standard to aim for whether they want to do this data collection themselves or not. Um, so what Curbler looks like is it's a JSON file, lives outside of GIS, and it's a way that we can take information about something like a motorcycle meter, turn it into information that has a geometry, so we could display it on a map, a location that is base map agnostic, um, and then structured information about what is it that's being allowed, uh, who can do this, at what time, under what payment conditions, and priority so that we can resolve conflicts over overlapping restrictions. 
Um, this creates a machine readable um, data standard that can be ingested into maps, visualization, routing engines, et cetera. So the goal is if we can create this technical solution in the middle and walk people through to how to create it, then companies and cities can start to use it. So that's what we've been working on. Um, why am I here? As we've been thinking about this, um, the map matching that we do is based on OSM. We believe that data should be open wherever possible. And so we really wanted to say, well, if we're going to do this work, can OSM already do this? And if so, what can we learn? And if not, why not? And how can we make this as complementary as possible? Um, and so here's what this looks like. Technically, you could map curb regulations in OSM right now, but I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work. So right now, you could go into the way, so the road center line, and you would tag something as parking lane and add parking conditional. You can then start to add kind of all these usage rules on top, and there's a hierarchy level so that if you have a no stopping and a resident parking, you get parking condition right side of the road, level one, parking condition right side of the road, level two, et cetera. So technically, this exists. It's very, very rare. There's a link at the bottom of this to a blog post that we wrote that kind of looks into this in more detail and pulls up stuff from Tag Info. Um, but really, the only time I see this is to mark free or permit or paid parking. Um, there's some cases, less than 1,000 around the world, uh, where somebody did really go into a lot of detail. This is actually not Germany. This is Toulouse in France. <laughs> And it is one of less than 1,000 um, parking regulations that have really been mapped um, up to three levels, uh, which is not uncommon. Like, my street has three. Um, but anyway, so you can see how unwieldy this is. And I'm not concerned about the number of tags here. That It's always going to be unwieldy. Map editing tools can help with that. The problem is that it can contradict itself in so many places. You can have parking rules on both sides of the road as opposed to parking conditions on the right side of the road. There's no information about how to resolve that. Um, and so part of this is a tagging issue, but honestly, the bigger issue is, is how we represent this in space. So here's an example street with those four restrictions on it. Um, this single street would then be subdivided into 13 different sections, some of which have three levels of rules, some have four. Um, if you look at that green line, sometimes it's level three, sometimes it's level four. This is impossible to map. You can't map one thing without mapping 13 others in detail. Um, Realigning geography suddenly has unintended consequences. I realign the road, I have moved a loading zone. Um, that's a problem. You could say, well, yeah, it's complicated, map it properly. But this affects every urban road around the world. I don't think it's appropriate to say map it properly. Like this just, it breaks down. You could say map it on a different geometry, but sidewalks, curb edges, same problem. If you start to think about an area, You've actually magnified that in another dimension, so that doesn't work. You could start adding new features. Uh, if that looks appealing to you, I'm sorry, uh, but that doesn't work. So fundamentally, it's not, sometimes maps are fantastic, but what we came to the realization of is that sometimes the map is the problem. Not everything can be represented with geographic coordinates. So we draw a line, we distinguish between a physical asset and what we call a regulatory geometry a concept that lives on top of physical space, like a road closure, like a speed limit, like a curb usage restriction that don't fit neatly into OSM or any other type of GIS. Um, there's some ways that we've been able to shoehorn these into OSM, something like a speed limit, but it only works because it's not that complicated. You don't have 14 happening on the same road. And so we really think that we need a different way to represent locations where rules apply. So our, our approach is to map physical assets that you can actually see and observe and ground truth, put those into OSM, but leave the derivation elsewhere. Um, so here's what that looks like. So a city today could go out and map its physical assets, so parking meters, parking signs, the beginning and end of a curb paint zone. You can see that. It's what communicates a legal rule to a, um, to a person on the street. They exist. They're always there. And they do have a latitude and a longitude. You can then attach structured data to that point about uh, what rules are in place. So hypothetically, we could call this curbside marker um, or any other name. Uh, in our CurbLR standard, we've come up with a pretty detailed and what we think is a very workable um, kind of tagging schema. You could apply that to OSM very easily or adapt it if parts of it are not desirable, um, similar to how traffic sign gets mapped, but that's only for movement restrictions. And this is really as far as the data goes in OSM. 
Um, what we think is that points can be processed into these regulatory geometries and updated um, and kept in a different format. Um, there's a variety of ways that you could do this mapping today. So I mentioned that Washington, D.C. uses imagery. They then go in and edit, and they get a geometry out of that. Um, Eugene, Oregon uses a Kyle with his pen and paper. We actually went out and we tried a bunch of open source methods. We used um, Open Data Kit slash Kobo, uh, same difference, as well as Open Map Kit. Um, and we found that there was location issues with both and kind of interface things that didn't really work. Um, our favorite was field papers and a camera. So we went out and surveyed a downtown. We've made this available again on our blog. It worked really well, and we're starting to work with Bellevue, Washington on using this method. But there's a ton of other ways that you could use a measuring wheel. There's, it's, it's not inherently a difficult problem if you can capture a photo as well as a location. Um, so there's a variety of ways that cities can do this now. OSM mappers can do this now. But regardless, once you've got those points, They've got to be converted into street segments. So we've created some tools that are available, again, on our GitHub that will take those points and turn them into segments, either by capturing the information about the beginning and the end of where that applies, or if you don't have that, by buffering something. So a parking meter is three, meter, a parking meter is three meters wide, and we can kind of turn that into a segment. Um, the interesting part is then we've got to reference the street somehow in a base map agnostic way. So if you were at this conference last year, um, Kevin Webb talked a lot about the shared streets referencing system and how we're working to develop map conflation tools so that we can port data between maps regardless of what of how you physically represent that street. So what happens is we have a linear referencing system that looks at the location of the start and the end of every intersection, as well as the bearing for the first 20 meters. As long as those are similar enough, a street will be assigned the same shared streets reference ID. Um, so we work with this so that we can help cities or help companies to match data to maps, whether they're using OSM or their own authoritative data or a different source. Um, so this is a way that we can say, we are all talking about the same segment of street, use whatever map you want. Um, so when we snap things to the street and we turn them into street segments, yes, we represent them on a map using OpenStreetMap, but more importantly, um, we've created kind of an identifier, the ABCD123, and we're saying, this is how we're going to refer to Main Street at 45 to 100 meters. And then we attach a structured regulation. So the benefits here, yes, we're doing it outside of OSM, but it is street linked. It is base map agnostic. We're using open source tools. They are available. And at any point, if a sign gets moved, you can regenerate this. So this is the process. And what it ends up with is that we take a bunch of points for a city, we process them, and we end up with this curb LR feed. So again, three components. We have a a geometry up at the top in the GeoJSON so we can drop it onto a map. We have that shared streets reference ID, location, um, and some other data. And then we have the structured rule. Um, so once we've got that, um, this is open data from the city of Calgary that a guy named Sadiq Mahiuddin has turned into um, both an API and a rules map for the city. We've taken that um, and we've adapted it and built off of it. And this is uh, 35,000 parking meters and signs for the city of LA. Um, and so we're starting to develop tools so that as cities go about either converting data that they already have or creating new data, they can visualize it and see the value of standardized data. So that's what we're working on. Um, kind of overall, my takeaways, I think, that I was hoping to convince you is that not everything fits neatly into a map. We can't necessarily fit these invisible rules, but we can fit the building blocks. And there are ways that OpenStreetMap can participate and be a part of this, so that whether you work at a city, whether you're a company, or whether you just want to advocate for something in your own city, um, you could start to map this. And you can do this today. Um, I think this is really important because I think um, Regardless of who you are, there should be a way that we could create this data. Um, there should be a way that everybody can have a role. Cool. And so with that, I think we have five minutes left, and I am happy to take any questions. Alyssa.
Yep. Yeah, so the question was, how is this data being used to make our lives better? Um, so for the curb, it's really early days, like very few cities have managed to map this. And it's kind of we're just starting to push out the standard and now work with cities to create the data. Um, but what I can say is that we also have a, a pilot where we work with uh, rideshare companies to release um, aggregated pick up and drop off data. So there, Washington, D.C. has used this information about where there's really high demand to have access to the edge of the street to create dedicated pick up and drop off zones so that hopefully you have a better experience as a passenger, but also you're not double parking in a bike lane. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's up to the city how they want to create this. Um, but a lot of the cities that we work with are pretty progressive about open data portals anyway. Um, the data that we showed for LA, we got from their open data portal. So presumably, if this is already open and we have something that's derived, um, that would then be open as well. Um, what I didn't talk about is that if you're creating data that lives in a JSON, you, know, you also have a discoverability issue. We don't necessarily have a solution to that. OpenStreetMap is open. You could, you could derive this. But where does it live? Like GTFS, you kind of have to think about where you can put it. Um, Mark, you had a question, but your hand came down. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, similar to the same question of uh, where is this data going to live, right? Um, do you have plans to create a uh, alternate reality or some basically a secondary layer of curved data that you can then import as a layer? So I think what we've said is that that physical assets, by all means, that can live in OSM and we can demonstrate, and then anybody could process it. I think what we end up with is these Kerbler feeds that are JSONs. And so it's not necessarily an issue of an extra layer, because again, we've kind of taken it out of the map and put it into something that you can drop into your own map or you can ingest through a rules engine or an API. Um, but we have a bunch of JSONs. So I think that's the issue is not necessarily how do we make another version of OSM, of Curb, Curb SM, but it's more like how do we? It's more like how do we have a transit land, honestly? Um, and who would host that? Who would maintain it? Is that a university thing? Is that a? Is that shared streets? Is that somebody else? Uh, second question. Uh, it seems that this would be a good standard to you know, maybe uh, work for other observation data, right? So curb data is observation data. Yep. Yeah, we have um, actually Indra Neal from Shared Streets is, gave a talk in parallel on um, road closures, because that's another one where we need to communicate this. Um, cities want to do it in an authoritative way. It doesn't really fit in OSM. How do we describe that? Um, so we've thought about road closures. Uh, we thought the, about the curb, and then I think it just keeps going from there. Uh, Alyssa? Um, so one of our partners is Ford Mobility, and they have a UK-based team that's really interested in, you know, how do we map London? That's a pretty difficult area to map. <laughs> and so, but what we found is that the referencing system, like, it, it works in that context. So if you can start to map, match maps, then you can generate these IDs regardless. And it's really a question of, has the way that we've come up with to describe the curb, does that make sense in their context? And I think because we were working with European partners and UK cities, and I live in a small town, because we had that context and relationships with various companies, we were able to get a pretty good sense, I think, of the different needs that we saw. Um, we released a draft form of Kerbler a few months ago, kind of as an invitation to collaborate and for people to say, this works, you miss this, what about this? Um, and we did a bunch of revisions after that based on people's input. Um, like any standard, it evolves over time. But I think for kind of the five to 10 cities worth of data that I've looked through, I haven't found anything that doesn't fit. Um, so I think it's pretty good. It's kind of a GTFS approach of essential, not exhaustive. Um, 
Yep. I think you could combine that data really nicely. So, you know, you could street reference your curb cut or your other ramp, your other feature, and you could basically say like on the street in this area is, is there an accessibility feature that I need? Um, we had a long chat with the wheel map team early on to say, you know, we don't understand all the accessibility issues. This is something that you work on. So what's important and how, how can we learn from this? Um, and what they kind of said is, you know, you could combine multiple sources of data and put them together. Um, they said that as they thought about accessibility, it became less of an issue about physical infrastructure and more of just a yes, no binary. Can I get my wheelchair there? I don't necessarily need a ramp right next to the curb. Maybe something along the street would do. And it really depended on the individual's mobility and what worked for them and what they were comfortable with. So they kind of said it's it's a more arbitrary thing. They map businesses as yes or no. Does this work? Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't combine that data about where the physical infrastructure is with the rule. Cool. They're telling me to kill it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.